Hi, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvellously well. Um, in today's episode, I want to talk about mixing live recordings. Now, um, if you, any of you know my resume, I've actually mixed a lot of live recordings. Um, I recently mixed Black Veil Bride's new uh, Blu-ray DVD called Alive and Burning. Um, I've mixed Joe Strummer, um, The Ramones, um, The Fray, Nelly Furtado. I did like a whole bunch of uh, Walmart session stuff and AOL sessions with the Bangles. Um, you name it, um, Pitbull, all kinds of different stuff. So I've mixed a lot of live stuff. And it's not like mixing studio recordings. You have to have a different mentality. Cleaning it up too much can actually ruin it. Um, so what I thought I'd do here is do a quick overview on mixing live recordings. Because increasingly, live recordings um, are starting to become sort of a norm because it's a way that we can get our material out there. If you're a local band, an artist, and you're trying to create some good you know, um, content, it's a great idea to just roll in a mobile rig, especially now with digital consoles where you can just literally take you know, a feed off a digital console and just print straight into a laptop, which is frankly what we did recording Black Veil Brides. We recorded them live at the Wiltern in Los Angeles, and that just literally went into a laptop front of house and a laptop on the monitors. So we recorded it twice, just off digital consoles. And all the tracks were separated. It was really easy to record, and then I came and mixed it. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you um, an old friend of mine, a guy called Dick Wagner, who was a very famous session guitar player in the 70s and 80s who played with um, Lou Reed, played with Aerosmith, played with, um, most famously, with in Alice Cooper's band and a whole bunch of other stuff. He wrote uh, Alice Cooper's biggest song, his only number one single, Only Women Bleed. And unfortunately, Dick died last year. So early this year, they had a memorial concert and uh, a whole bunch of people got together, you know, including Brad Whitford from Aerosmith and a whole bunch of wonderful, wonderful players like Danny Serafin from Chicago. A whole bunch of guys got together, guys and girls, and recorded, um, you know, played a huge show and we recorded it live. And now I'm coming to mix it for the DVD Blu-ray release. So let's have a look at it. Please, as ever, subscribe. Go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list, and leave me loads of questions and comments. Okay, so here we are. As you can see above here to the right, I have um, a screenshot. So this is basically a QuickTime movie taken from the soundboard. And that is great because it allows me to understand all of the panning. So number one thing, make sure, sure you have, if it's filmed, a QuickTime or at least a photograph of the stage setup so you know where to pan your instruments. Otherwise, it could be quite embarrassing if you're watching a Blu-ray or a DVD and the lead guitar player is panned all the way to the right and he's standing on the left. Or the lead singer, you know, the background singers are on the right and the vocals are to the left, etc. So that's the first thing. So I have a quick time in there ready to go. Now, I do a lot of the same tricks that I would do for basic mixing anyway. Uh, there are Drum samples. I use the drum samples because live there's a lot of bleed, so I'm going to use the live drums, but I'm going to add samples to it to give it just a little bit more punch and a little bit more control in the mix. In particular, if you listen to the live kick here, it's okay, but it's very dynamic. Um, it's, you know, I, I like it, but I don't love it. And I've got, you know, a trim here to bring me up some level because it was printed pretty low. I've got EQ because it was very, very clicky. So I've taken the top end off and I've got an API, you know, I've, I've boosted the 7K, but I've got rid of this sort of 12K buzz that was on it. There was like a bzz, really high frequency buzz and do my usual low mid cut, etc. So it's pretty straightforward what I'm doing. Um, I've got some extra EQ on my kick bus. So stuff that I would do normally but I've added, you know, I've added my kick samples, which honestly are a lot louder in this instance. So here we go with the kick samples. You're going to hear a dramatic difference. So it's quite a lot of additional kicks on this one.
You see, because that is definitely part of the kick part, that da 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 and not all of it printed because it was super, super dynamic. Okay, so same thing with the snare. Let's just check out the snare top. Here's the snare top. It's pretty snappy. Snare bottom, let's add that in. Again, got a trim tool on here. Um, what I'm actually doing here, you may have seen me do this before, is I'm trying to get the snare in phase with the overheads. So if we look at the overheads, as you can see, the levels are printed super low in this recording. I didn't record this. This was recorded by somebody else. Okay, so if I do Option, Command, and then I use the Bracket tool. This is for a Mac, unfortunately, only, but Option, Command, Bracket. You can see I can make the waveforms bigger and smaller. And what I did is... And this will get your snare nice and snappy. Is I just drag the top back slightly. See 123 samples. See it's coming back in phase. If you see here, let's zoom in a little closer. Here you go. And then the front of the waveform there. Can you see it here? Up, bump. It says about 116. It probably varies all over it. I've gone 123. That was probably a greater average. So I'm bringing that snare back in phase. All of my, all of my samples all come back the same. You see, as I click along. So it's really important to me that we get as much snap out of this as possible. Phase polarity is really important. You want slamming drums? Make sure your phase and your polarity is, you know, your polarity is really good. So everything is hitting at the same time. And I like my overheads to have a little bit more body. I don't EQ the bottom end out of it entirely. I might take some of the low end out of my overheads, but I don't take it out completely because that's a good image of a kit. I've noticed, I've, I've, I've watched other people's videos and I see a lot of, and particularly in rock, they literally just EQ everything out of the overheads and it's all just cymbals. And then you end up with this really disjointed drum kit that goes, don't get, don't get, do get, do do get. There's no like overall energy in the drums because the overheads, especially in a live situation, is part of the inherent sound of the drums. Now, obviously on stage, there's gonna be bleed. So we've got to be very aware of that, that we were, we're also, you know, want to remove some of the low, low rumble of maybe the bass guitar and everything getting in there. But essentially, I don't go too crazy. Okay, so here's my samples on my snare. Let's add those in, just so you can hear what they're doing. Let's go to somewhere where they're playing heavily here. Now, one thing you're going to notice is I'm using a lot of verb. Why am I using a lot of verb? It's live. If you were in that auditorium, it was going to be huge. If you want to preserve the feel of a live concert, don't make it cool and tight and, and you know, like a, a maybe a, um, a studio recording. This is live. You're in a huge auditorium. You can see even just from that shot that it's a pretty big space. So it's got to feel not cavernous, but it's got to feel large. It's very important with live stuff that you get that feel. Okay, um, the other thing I've done, which I do a lot on my Tom trick, I call it the Tom trick, is I have gained down. Now this is time consuming and you can automate, you can do all kinds of stuff, but what I've done here is I've gained down all of the bleed in the toms here. If I go to an unedited one, say here, you can see there's a lot of bleed. So what I do is I gain down, I always do minus 21 or minus 18 dB, and what you'll see it will give us, it's tough because it's, it's never perfect, but you'll see what it does here for the floor. See the amount of bleed that's in there? And to be honest, we could go in there and clean that up a little bit more, you see? If you hear the cymbal bleed, we could do this. See here? So what I could do here is I could just highlight, and you can use the tab tool. Let's go to our tab to transient tool up here. Let's see, wait for it to highlight. Let's engage that. Okay, and then I can hit tab. I can go to where the symbol here is. Hit B to cut. Go to the tab to transient here. Hit B to cut. Hit Command M to mute. Put a fade in here which if I just go to the point where I want to start the fade and hit G, 
and see it's created a fade from the right hand side of it. If I go to the front of this one here and do the reverse, I can go here, I can hit D and it will create a fade to the left hand side of it. So that's taking the symbols out of the toms. Have a listen. Another one there. So let's zoom here. We'll hit tab, cut, tab, cut. So that's tab and a B. Select here, hit G, select this, double click on it. Command M is mute. Let's drag this over to the right hand side, hit D, and there we have taken that symbol out as well. Cool. Now, you might not want to take it off completely. Another thing you could do is volume automate it or gain it down. I do both of those. But for just for the time being, because there's a lot of symbol bleed, a quick fix, that's what we're doing. There's many different things. You just got to be careful not to chop it up too much. But I think for the toms, I'm fine with that. Okay, so there's a quick bit of editing there just to uh, help the toms poke themselves out. Okay, so let's have a listen to all of the drums together. There's the occasional peak here. And you can hear bleed from all the other instruments. It's fine. It's live. There's just some, some bleed we want to control and other bleed we don't. So next we have bass, which is printed as a stereo file. It's a DI only, so there's no real bleed in there which is absolutely fine. What I've done here is I have um, done my usual thing where I've got my multiband compressor. So if you look at all my bass mixing stuff, you'll see the same techniques. This is pretty straightforward. It's a DI, there's no bleed. There's no real issue here. But as you can see, um, I've got the low mids um, controlled with the multiband compressor. So they're very even. If you go to my bass mixing, you'll see the same tricks. There's an REQ, boosting some of the high mids just for some definition. A little 100 hertz, some 800 for a little. And then the R bass over the top to just kind of give us some bottom end. Just some even bottom end. It's so 80, so it's kind of round around about 80. Kick sits about 60 to uh, 40 to 60. Bass about 80 to 100 for some of that low lows. Um, and then I've got my old friend MV2, which is basically a parallel compressor in a box. Um, it's a great plugin. You see, it's keeping the super sensitive stuff, pushing it up, but then also compressing over the top. So this left hand side is like having a parallel compressor in one plugin. Really tasty. I love that plugin. It's a very, very useful tool. Okay, so that's our bass. Um, the bass, there was a bass amp. It was barely audible. We didn't use it. I mean, you're going to find with live mixing, there's going to be all kinds of issues. You just have to work around it depending on how it was recorded. You know, sometimes, you know, like this, this is a makeshift concert with tons of people getting together, you know, and guys just turning up and playing. And, you know, it's going to always be. Um, you know, a bit of a battle when it comes to mix to make it work, but that's your job is to make it work. Okay, here's some guitar. Very heavily chorus guitar. I've got a low mid boost here, a gentle roll off, not a harsh high pass, some 6, 7k boost for some top end. As you know, I love my Mac DSP plugins, they're very organic, very real sounding. So more 7k boost because it was really dull sounding. Some 5k boost on it. API 550s, I use the real ones. I like the plugins, they're great. MV2 again, listen. It's giving us volume, it's also giving us a little oomph on that bottom end, a little push up. And then over the top, I've got a little, believe it or not, Free bomb factory comes with Pro Tools plugin. It's just nice for just smoothing stuff out. And then I'm sending to a reverb just to 
make it feel more live because it's just a close mic and it's not really getting anything. You know you hate this game. He slaps you once in a while and you live and love with Just move on. There's some key stuff, DI again. DI, so what are we doing? We're putting a little bit of verb on that. Again, off an MV2, you're going to end up seeing this a lot more, this kind of stuff. Stay. Now with a live vocal like this, when all you're really looking there's bleed. For. There's bleed in the lead vocal. There's nothing you can do about that. If you try to go in there and automate every single thing out, it will sound dreadful. Trust me, I've tried. I did it with Anthony Kiedis um, on a Ramones tribute concert, and the Chili Peppers came up and played you know, some Ramones songs. It was really wonderful. But Anthony is a really dynamic performer. So he's like swinging all over the place. He's spinning on stage. I mean, it's a great live show. It's fantastic to watch. So wherever he was spinning, you know, here's a bit more hi-hat. Here's a bit more guitar. I mean, I did all kinds of stuff. I sat there. I multiband compressed. I removed as much top end as I could. But some of the times it just made the vocals feel dull. So I learned from that experience. You're better off letting that kind of all come through to a certain extent because if you do that it will sound more even because taking, trying to get there and pull out individual things, when there is bleed into the vocal, you'll get like, I don't know, shh, why don't shh you? And you'll just get this like, you know, sibilance of uh, all the symbols bleeding through the vocal. And then you'll pull them all out and it will just sound dreadful. It'll sound like the symbols are really loud, then are out, then are loud, then are out, then are out. You're better off just trying to control the volume of the vocal more evenly. So the only kind of volume stuff I've done here is between when it goes super, super quiet, there's not a lot of volume automation. In fact, what I'm doing is I'm using a vocal rider here gently. Man makes your hair gray. He's your life's mistake. When all you're really looking for. See the way the vocal rider is set up, it's really just keeping it even the whole time. It's a really wonderful tool. You can sit there and draw on all that volume automation, or you can use the vocal rider and it will sit there and it will push and pull the vocal. So it sits in the same place all the time. The bleed remains constant. It's a blessing. And then I go to my vocal sub. I've got my usual Arvox front here. Some gentle de-essing. Man makes your hair gray. Some EQ, some top end lift, when all you really looking some for gentle R comp, a little bit more EQ afterwards. Break. You'll notice I like to EQ compress, EQ compress. I won't always, you know, just compress and then just EQ in, in, in an order. I will do little increments. I think it's smoother, it sounds better, it doesn't have that EQ'd sound where you use one EQ and just do drastic moves. For vocals in particular, just small amounts of movement, small amounts of compression are going to really help you. Another de because even though it was becoming brighter, it, the vocal sounded better. Of course, some of the de some of the S's needed to be controlled. Man makes your hair gray. See that? He's your life's mistake. Great. And then I'm using all my same vocal tricks. I've got a little bit of a distortion going on, vocal distortion. I've still got the octave running underneath the fan it, and I've still got the whisper. Now, the octave, um, I am pulling down in areas, you know, because sometimes when it's super, super intimate, you can hear the octave in there. But when the whole band's playing, it really helps to fatten up her voice. I'm also writing a probably a little bit more distortion than I normally would because she's kind of a Janis joplin -y kind of singer. Okay, next... I've got a, a, a dirty delay print, which I do all the time. You'll notice in my vocal mixing videos. Just a subtle amount. And then I've got my vocal thickening trick, which you can go to the vocal thickening video and see. So I'm doing similar things. I'm just not gating and overly, you know, volume riding the vocal. I'm letting the volume come through of the bleed and stuff because it adds to the live experience. And honestly, I'm using more, I'm using louder um, reverbs and delays, etc., than I normally would because it's live. Have a listen. Only women bleed. Only women bleed. Only women bleed. Only women bleed. Man makes your hair. 
sounds live. You know, all of that extra ambience, don't be afraid to do it. Now, the only other thing I think we can talk about is our room mics. Don't be afraid to pull them up and down where needed. You know, um, if you see here, there's some little cheered moments here. Have a listen. Music. I think maybe that music will fit my title. It's called Only Women Bleed. There's Dick talking. See, I'm pulling them up there because they're really inaudible. They're so low on the recording, so I'm just pushing them where I need them. You know, there's like a wolf whistle going in there. I might try and find that to pull up. I mean, these are the things that you need to kind of anticipate. In the actual mix, it's pretty loud because with the band playing, if you have a listen here. Now it's tough. You'll notice there was a lot of low mids that I pulled out. That just adds. So I'm just using it for a little bit of ambience. And I actually put a reverb plug in across it just to make it sound bigger than it really was. There's a second set of room mics here. Which actually were a little bit more natural. So they're, they're, they're put in and they're pushed and they're pulled. You always want room mics because you're going to need them for the crowd and the ambience and the excitement, but you just have to be careful where you use them and how you use them because sometimes, depending on where they are, they might be completely out of phase with everything else. Um, on some rock stuff that I've mixed live, some like heavy rock, the kick is so loud. You know, the click of the kick on heavy rock is so loud in the front of the house that you try and pull the room mics up, you literally get this terrible flam between the live kick that you've recorded or has been recorded that you've been given and the front of house live kick. And it's like a it's not like it's like this terrible slap. So with those, I automate them quite drastically. You know, with a heavy rock thing, I might just push just for crowd noises. And you have to get surgical sometimes. You have to get surgical and pull out things that are flamming. You have to do little volume rises, all kind of creativity. But in general, the secret really is, is to try and preserve as much of it as possible. Don't get too carried away with riding, with, with trying to ride the vocal and stuff, because that bleed is going to add a lot of natural stuff to it. So let's have a quick listen to the track. Cool. So you get to hear it there. Um, there'll probably be an ad running on the front of this because this is a Dick Wagner, Alice Cooper song. So I apologize if you're watching an ad. We don't usually run ads at the front of our videos, but uh, I don't think I'll have any control over this one because um, this is not one of the songs I wrote. So thanks very much for watching. Now, obviously, that is scratching the surface on a live mix. Um, I didn't record that, so, you know, I don't have the same control of as, as, as stuff as I would when I'm recording it. A lot of the live stuff that I've mixed, I've also recorded. Um, but, you know, if you're going to get into doing and specializing in this kind of stuff, um, which there was a lot of guys out there who just mix or mainly mix live stuff and do a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, you know, I've had to do 5-1 mixes of a lot of the stuff I've done. Um, I don't think we'll do 5-1 on this, um, but, you know, it's a possibility. And when you do 5-1 stuff, what you tend to do is take everything that you've mixed and then do stereo files and stem it out, you know, and then go in and mix specifically for 5-1 using stems. And what I do there is I'll have the guitars relatively dry and then have the ambience of the guitars printed in a separate stem and then I can pan those wide or behind you know have the audience mic and the reverberation of the audience mic behind you and just create the illusion of being in a room um, that's a whole different topic and a long topic and also this is just scratching the surface on the live stuff so please as ever leave some questions below leave comments if you've mixed live stuff i'd love to know how you did it and what your experiences are and um, as ever please subscribe go to produce like a pro and sign up for the email list and uh, thank you ever so much for watching